And how are demographics and technology reshaping the future of work, firms, and networks? Dr. Tasu Shervani, he's professor at the Cox School of Business at the Southern Methodist University right here in Dallas, Texas, and at TIA's Connectivity Jam. He's here to tell us about how information networks will evolve rapidly in the coming years. And Dr. Shervani, welcome to the program. Thank you, Abe. Good to be here. Well, thanks for being here. I know you just came off a keynote here at TIA's Connectivity Jam. How did that go, just real quick? Uh, you know, great. Uh, th it was a terrific audience, uh, very engaged, as, as it always is at uh, TIA, uh, and um, t a terrific response uh, from the audience to some of the ideas that put forward a lot of questioning and a lot of feedback and interaction with people following the keynote. Well, I know you in the keynote, and, you, and you've done this before. I remember several, several years back, you gave somewhat of a similar keynote talking about the major societal issues that we're dealing with right now, really around job growth. Um, yeah. There's some factors that are impacting job growth. One is immigration, another is uh, trade, and the third is technology, and that really uh, uh, takes up a lot of sort of the bandwidth, if you will, for uh, maybe the lack of jobs. Um, can you go into a little bit of, uh, on those three factors, but really focusing on technology? Absolutely. Y you know, Abe, there's a lot of concern in, in many societies about where the jobs of the future are going to come from. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of countries have turned inward. Brexit, you know, for example, uh, a few months ago, a lot of people would argue uh, the, the, the United States turning more inward, putting America first was response to that. And I, I call technology, trade, and immigration the, the three horsemen of the jobs apocalypse. You know, the idea that these things are going to take our jobs away now. So if you look at technology and trade and immigration, uh, technology is probably responsible for about 80% of the jobs that go away. They're re replaced by a new technology. There's probably about 10% that are lost as a result of trade. You know, you do, let's say some jobs eventually will, will go to Mexico or will go to China, you know, the more trade we do with those countries. And obviously, some jobs are lost to immigration as well if, an, say, an immigrant comes in from another country and takes a job. But that's probably about 10% and 10% for trade and immigration but really it's about 80% for, uh, for technology. Now, technology is something that we can do very little about in terms of stopping. Technology is going to continue to progress. We spend more than $500 billion a year in R&D in the United States, more than a trillion and a half dollars around the world. A big chunk of that is spent on information and communications technology R&D. We had, just last year alone, $65 billion of venture capital deployed to bring these new technologies to market. So when you look at technology, you're not going to slow that horseman down, right? In fact, that horse is only going to gallop faster and faster. So what do people do? They turn their attention to trade and immigration, right? And those become big factors in elections, whether it's, it's Brexit or in the United States or elsewhere in Europe and, and, and around the world. Mm. But I like to keep my attention on the biggest of those three horsemen, uh, technology. And that's what the talk really focused on. How is technology going to change the world around us? How is it going to change the nature of work? How is it going to change firms? How is it going to change networks? And what we can do to really make sure that we continue to be relevant even as technology evolves and changes and grows and develops. Just get into a little, bit, a little bit about some of those trends in the technology space that are impacting those areas that you just mentioned. A, a, you know, the age that we are living in is called the age of information. Um, and the information age really dawned, uh, I believe, in, in 1948 when an engineer at Bell Labs named Claude Shannon published a very important article um, and established information theory as a, as, as a discipline. And uh, Claude Shannon did a couple of things. You know, one is he defined an information system. An information system must have a source that conceives a message. That message is then sent to a transmitter. The transmitter then sends that message over a pipeline where it gets to a receiver at the other end that receives the message and decodes it and sends the message on to its uh, ultimate destination. So if you think of an information system, you, you realize that there are really five different types of businesses that exist in the information age. You could either be a content creator, somebody that's creating a message. You could be a content aggregator, much like a transmitter, somebody that's aggregating a lot of content and getting ready to send it over a pipeline. You could be in the pipeline business, actually creating the networks that move information from point A to point B. When that information gets to the other end, you could be in the business of decoding, receiving and decoding that information. 
And while in the past that was done by human beings, the flow of information in today's world means that it'll increasingly be done by machines working off of artificial intelligence. Mm. And then ultimately that information gets to its destination. Mm. And of course, for the longest time, the destination was just human beings. But today we are talking about the internet of things or even the internet of everything. And the internet of everything says that every machine, every sensor, even every animal in the world might have its own IP address. So you, you could think of every cow, every chicken, every pig, every goat, every sheep, mm -hmm. maybe even every wild animal in Yellowstone Park, every grizzly bear that's tagged, uh, you know, having their own IP address. Uh, so at the end of the day, the destination could be a human being, it could be an animal, it could be a device, it could be a machine. Uh, and, and so the information system as defined by Claude Shannon is becoming a lot more complex. And it's creating five categories of businesses, the content creators, the content packages and distributors, those who make the pipeline, those who are involved in the reception and decoding and analysis of that information, and then those who ultimately use that information, which we are calling the internet of everything. Uh, so that's how technology is really transforming the world around us. I mentioned in the introduction, and this is a major part of your, uh, your presentation earlier here at the Jam, uh, I talked about demographics and technology and how those two areas are converging and really affecting the marketplace. Can you go into that a little bit more? Yes, so, so you know, w what happens is that you know, on the one hand, you know, we are very concerned that many of the jobs we know today will go away, and they will go away largely because of technology, as I said, not so much trade and immigration, but mostly technology. Um, so what does the demographic picture look like? What does the supply of people look like? Mm. And um, one of the points I made in the keynote, um, as I did the last time as well, is that the birth rate, uh, the number of children that each woman has on average, worldwide, continues to decline. Now this is important because 2.1, the average number of children per woman, if that is 2.1, that is known as the replacement rate. Mm. If a woman has exactly 2.1 children on average, the population of the world remains constant. Think about it, we all die one day mm. and men cannot have babies. So a woman must have one child to replace herself, one child to replace a man, and the extra point one is for what we call risk management, because not all children who are born make it to maturity. Right. Well, around the world, that birth rate is rapidly approaching 2.1. Mm. In fact, it's at about 2.5 right now worldwide. And in developed countries, in Europe, in Japan, in, in the United States and in Canada, that birth rate is well below the replacement mm. rate. So, in fact, while we worry about not having enough jobs, the ultimate problem may be that we don't have enough people. Mm. So the idea is that we actually have to develop technology to the point that artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, etc., go to the point that as the human workforce begins to peak and decline, which is going to happen in the next 15 to 20 years, mm. that the technology is there and it's available to us to actually take over some of those functions. So it's not the dire prediction of technology eating up all jobs and people not having enough work to do. Oh. In fact, quite the contrary, if technology doesn't evolve rapidly enough, we may not have enough of a supply of people mm. and certainly not of educated people to, to do those jobs. Mm. So from a public policy perspective, you know, we have to manage this very carefully. We have to manage it in a sober, rational, reasonable manner without panicking <laughs> and uh, you know, without flailing our arms and, and worrying about things that we perhaps don't even have to worry about in the future. Now, uh, sticking with uh, convergence, and, I, and three years ago I asked you uh, this question. I asked you, what was the current state of play back then for the telecom, the telco industry? And then before we actually got on to this discussion, you said there was a convergence between technology, media, and telecom more now than ever. More now than ever. So, so tell us about that. So, um, you know, when we had met the last time in, in 2014, uh, about a year before that, um, Comcast, a cable company, had acquired NBC Universal, a media company. Uh, since then, you know, a lot more has happened. Of course, uh, AT&T has acquired um, uh, DirecTV, which mm -hmm. is a, a stack to entertainment distribution company, and is in the process of acquiring Time Warner. If uh, the regulatory approval is uh, 
is, is received for that acquisition by the end of this year, AT&T will own Time Warner. You know, Verizon has gone on to acquire AOL and Yahoo. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last three or four years, uh, certainly Netflix from the technology side has grown in prominence. Uh, Amazon has moved into distributing, uh, actually producing content through Amazon Studios and distributing it over Amazon Prime. Uh, Google has moved into subscription models uh, on YouTube. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Apple has made no secret of its desire to be in the television business, perhaps to even be in the automotive business. Google wants to be in the automotive business uh, insofar as a, a self-driving car uh, is concerned and technology that they're working and on developing. So, technology, which is Google, Apple, Facebook, um, Microsoft, uh, IBM, Cisco, uh, Media, which traditionally was, you know, Disney, Fox, mm -hmm. uh, Viacom, now has NBC Universal and Time Warner that are going to be owned by telecom companies. Mm -hmm. And telecom companies like AT&T and Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, Comcast, Charter, and Time Warner Cable, really all coming together uh, into into one industry, and they are crossing over into each other's turf. Um, so one of the things that we are going to see, of course, is more mergers and acquisitions mm. in that space, where these three separate industries actually become one industry. But beyond that, beyond the mergers and acquisitions, we are going to see a level of growth uh, that comes out of TMT that I think is going to be on a scale that we haven't seen before. Um, Let's look at the Internet of Things for a second. Mm -hmm. You know, the impact of technology so far has largely been in the consumer domain. That is, things that consumers used to do, read magazines, you know, listen to radio, watch TV. Mm -hmm. Now all that's being done on the Internet. Uh, and, and convergence has taken place there. In fact, Google is the biggest uh, um, um, player now in the advertising business. Uh, right? And Facebook is rapidly becoming a, a very big player has become a very big player and is taking on Google for leadership uh, in the advertising business. But now the action is going to shift to the B2B space in terms of the Internet of Things and making sure that machines and sensors are connected. So the automobile is rapidly becoming a connected device. Uh, mm -hmm. Healthcare is rapidly becoming a connected system. Uh, cities uh, are rapidly becoming connected cities. Um, uh, distribution and warehousing is rapidly becoming connected distribution and warehousing. So the entire um, co-mingling of the information world and the physical world is moving beyond the consumer space into the B2B space very, very rapidly. Mm. And that I think will continue to provide a very significant source of growth for both technology and telecom companies. And that's the main reason why it is technology companies and telecom companies that are gobbling up media companies, rather than media companies gobbling up mm -hmm. telecom and technology companies, because the B2B opportunity actually is going to be much bigger than the B2C opportunity mm. that we've seen so far. Oh, that, that, that last point you made could be a whole other discussion, I would imagine. So. Absolutely. Now, was that part of your presentation? The uh, Yes, yes, okay. absolutely. I talked about technology, media, and telecom um, um, coming together and the, uh, the B2B opportunity that's being created. That's interesting because it's a convergence of industries, companies, and technologies. You would think that would reduce uh, the uh, amount of opportunity in the job market, but in fact, you're saying it's the opposite. Quite the opposite. Um, and I, I gave a set of reasons for it, uh, Abe. Um, the reason is, complexity. The, the world is becoming more complex. Uh, clearly, there is complexity on, on many dimensions. There's legal complexity. So, mm -hmm. for example, what happens to automobile insurance uh, when the car is, uh, is driverless? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, some people say, well, it's going to be very simple, but in my opinion, the law never becomes simple. The law becomes more complex. The legal code in the United States, that book, the number of pages in it, only gets bigger and bigger and bigger every, we haven't had a single year in the history of, of the human race that the legal code has gotten smaller. Right. It's only gotten bigger. <laughs> so I think legal complexity is, is going to uh, increase over time. Um, technological complexity is going to increase. You know, to think about it, today we have 30,000 commercial aircraft that airlines fly, and maybe we have another half a million private aircraft. And in every country, we have an air traffic control system that is staffed by thousands of people, make sure that these planes can take off and land and don't collide with each other. Imagine, if 10 years down the road, we have a billion drones flying around. You mm -hmm. know, what kind of an air traffic control system 
will it take? Yeah. Well, you can't have human beings saying, drone 101, you're cleared to land, right? There's going to be a billion of them. You, can't, you don't even have enough human beings to do the job. Right. So it'll have to be done by machines with artificial intelligence. Imagine the task of creating that system and keeping it running. I mean, that's trillions of dollars mm -hmm. at the very least mm -hmm. of, of growth uh, and, and opportunity. Geographic complexity, you know, our supply chains are becoming more complicated over time. And geopolitical complexity. So you, you, have, you have Brexit, you have potentially withdrawal from trade packs, you have conflict with the US and Russia, conflict in the Middle East, conflict with the US and North Korea, the relationship between the US and China. I mean, if anybody tells me that the geopolitics of the world is going to get any easier over the next 20 years, I would be very, very surprised. I don't think it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, ten years ago, you know, there's probably no company that had a chief information security officer. Today, you cannot survive without a chief information security officer mm. because all kinds of state and non-state actors are attacking your, your, your networks. So, the world on every dimension, right, whether it's legally, technology-wise, geographically, geopolitically, is becoming more complex. And, and, and so, I see the creation of work and the creation of jobs, but they will be new types of jobs that didn't exist before, right? Just like when, you know, you had horse-driven carriages and there were a lot of people who would, uh, uh, you know, ride those, uh, those carriages. Mm -hmm. uh, well, those jobs don't exist, but a whole bunch of other jobs exist as a result of the shift to the, uh, to the automobile. And if the automobile becomes driverless, well, there's going to be a whole ton of other jobs that are going to exist as well. What we have to do to take advantage of these jobs is to make sure that the level of education in society as a whole rises. In 1940, 60% of Americans had an elementary edu school education. Mm. Only 29% had a high school education and less than 10% had even gone to college. Today, 60% of our population has gone to college, but on average they have one year mm. of, of college. Mm. I would say that in 30 or 40 years from now, the average level of education for an American would be three to four years more mm. than it is now, right? So if we succeed in educating our workforce, we will succeed in finding jobs for them, the new jobs that are created. Uh, if we don't succeed in educating them, then uh, I think it's a different ball game. But I'm at a university and that's my day job, is uh, to make sure that we have an education system that works not just for today, but for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years as well, and, and we are hard at work creating that. I think the attraction for uh, our industry and the reason why you had uh, standing room only in your presentation earlier was that your research goes well beyond technology and really has an impact on society, and you sort of illustrate that uh, for the audience, so that's important. I uh, hope we don't wait another three years to talk again. I hope it's uh, much sooner than that. I would be delighted to be back anytime. All right, Dr. Shervani, thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.